So let's jump in here to chapter four on page numbers 80 and 81. So this whole chapter is all about transferring title to real estate, ways that real estate could be transferred. And let's be honest, the vast majority of the time that uh, real estate is transferred, generally we're gonna transfer it through deed. So real estate is typically transferred using a deed, but there's a whole bunch of other ways real estate could be transferred, which is kind of the focus and purpose of this chapter. One way, for example, real estate could be transferred is here on page 81, real estate could be transferred through a will. Now, uh, will, all of us have one, and you might say to yourself, that, uh, that's not gonna be the case. I don't have a, I don't have a road of will, you might say. A very famous writer once said, I knew everyone had to die, but I thought God would make an exception in my case. Unfortunately, that's not the way the world works. So all of us have a will, even if you haven't written your own. If you die without a will, you're said to have died intestate here on page number 81. And you'll see this term intestate at the top of 81. Intestate basically means you've died without having, make, having made a will. Now, succession is basically California's will for you. So California's will for you, of course, is called succession at the top of page number 81. Now, here's something to think about with regard to succession. If you haven't written your own will, you've died intestate. California's will for you is called succession. Now, there's a couple of vocabulary words at the bottom of page 81 that we should have a look at. One of these is the word devise at the bottom of 81. So a devise is a gift of real estate by will. So a gift of real estate by will is called a devise. So watch, Uncle Fred dies and leaves you his house in his will. It's called a devise. Uncle Fred dies and leaves you his car in his will. That's not a devise because a car is not real estate. A car is personal property. That's, of course, known as a bequest. So note the difference at the bottom of 81 between a devise and a bequest. A devise is a gift of real estate by will, whereas a bequest is a gift of personal property by will. So Uncle Fred dies and leaves you his watch in his will. That's called a bequest, very important vocabulary term. Uncle Fred dies and leaves you his house in his will. That's, of course, called a devise. Now, just as a review, someone who's died without making a will is said to have died intestate. California's will that you'll be using, of course, is called succession at the top of 82. So here's what happens. In intestate succession, you've died without making your own will. So basically, you're forced to use the state's will. The state's will for you is called succession. Now, if you have community property, you'll remember from chapter number three, the last chapter, you'll recall that community property could be willed. Now, if you die intestate without a will, your half of your community property in California will go to the spouse, right? Because you didn't make a will. Now, you could will that half of that home or that car or whatever it is to someone else if it's community property. But if you die intestate, it'll end up with the spouse, the surviving spouse. It gets more interesting when you talk about separate property. Let's say you have separate property, property that you had, for example, before you got married. You die intestate. Well, half of your separate property will go to your spouse. The other half will go to your kid if you have one kid. Half to the spouse, half to the kid. If you don't like that, what should you do? Write a will. You have a spouse and more than one kid. You die intestate. You have separate property. One third will go to the spouse. Two thirds will be distributed equally amongst the kids. If you don't like that, what do you need to do? Write a will. So intestate succession is only relevant if you die without having made your own will. Now, if you have a will, of course, page number 82 is irrelevant because you're going to be using your will. But if you die intestate, the state's got to know what to do with your stuff. They have this flow chart called intestate succession. So watch. Let's say you had a spouse and five kids. You have separate property. You die intestate. One third will go to the spouse. Two thirds will be distributed equally amongst the five kids. If you don't like any of that, what do you need to do? You need to make a will. So if you've decided that a will is important, now you could, of course, use a living trust or there's other sort of uh, ways to tell your survivors what you want done with your stuff after you die. 
but let's assume at the top of 83, you're using a will. Now there's two types of wills that are important for us to know for our test. One of these is called a witnessed will at the top of 83. Now a witnessed will is what it sounds like. A witnessed will is a will that you sign and somebody else countersigns it. Maybe it's an attorney, maybe it's, for example, a uh, notary, but you sign the will and somebody else signs next to you saying that they saw you sign it. That's a witness will. By the way, does this sound like a pretty safe type of will? Of course, because you're signing it and a witness is signing next to you. It seems pretty safe. Another type of will is a holographic will. A holographic will at the top of 83 is a will that is made entirely in the handwriting of the maker. So a completely handwritten will is a holographic will. Now, because a holographic will is entirely handwritten, the will actually does not need to be witnessed. So a holographic will is still signed and dated, but it doesn't need to be witnessed because it's entirely in the handwriting of the maker. Now, a great way to look at this is uh, in 1976, two very wealthy people died that same year in 76. J. Paul Getty and Howard Hughes, both brilliant business people, but they both died in 76. Now, J. Paul Getty, very organized, very fastidious. J. Paul Getty had a properly drafted witnessed will. His estate wrapped relatively quickly, given its size. I mean, he was worth about $2 billion at the time of his death in 1976. Howard Hughes, also a genius, uh, maybe in some ways, more, much more eccentric than J. Paul Getty, and uh, Howard Hughes died in 76 also, but he had a bunch of these random handwritten holographic wills, and they seemed to pop up out of nowhere. In fact, even the Mormon church had a copy of a holographic will that they alleged that Howard Hughes had written, leaving much of his estate to the Mormon church. His estate took decades to wrap up because a holographic will is quite easily challenged, and it can spend a lot of time in probate. So a will entirely handwritten, of course, is a holographic will. Now, you might see this question on the test asked like this. There can be no typed portions of what kind of will? Holographic. A holographic will is entirely handwritten. And a holographic will, because it's handwritten, does not need to be witnessed. Now, a witnessed will is probably safer. Now, either way, whether you have a holographic will or a witnessed will, the will will still need to be put through the probate court here at the middle of 83. Now, a couple questions that we need to know about probate sales of real estate first. Do you think that a real estate licensee could profit from a probate real estate deal? They can. Now, if somebody dies, they may have a house that needs to be sold as part of the administration of their estate. That will will still need to go through the probate court here on page number 83. Now, the way real estate agents can make money at this is a real estate agent might make friends with, let's say, a probate attorney, and somebody's passed away. The probate attorney will then engage through the estate a real estate agent to help sell the uh, deceased property. Now, there's a couple things that we should know about probate court, and you'll see these at the bottom of page 83 in the gray box where it says probate sales of real estate. So the first thing I would do is I would look at the bottom black square in that gray box at the bottom of 83. Broker commissions are subject to statute and court approval. So if the question on the test were to say, who sets the broker's commission in a probate sale? The court sets the broker's commission in a probate sale. That way you don't have a real estate agent that kind of takes advantage of a grieving family, you know, after somebody's passed away, saying, hey, look, you know, I've been so sad to hear about your family member's passing. I'm going to take care of everything for you. Just pay me a 12% commission. I'll take care of everything. Now, there's nothing illegal about doing a commission at 12%. It's just in probate court, that commission has to be blessed by who? Blessed by the court, right? So if the question on the test were to say, who approves the broker's commission in a probate deal? The court approves the broker's commission in a probate deal. Another thing I'd look at at the bottom of 83 is, because it's on the test but not in the book, I would write the words minimum bid equals 90% of the appraised value. So the minimum bid for a property in probate court must be at least 
90% of the appraised value. And again, this is to protect the estate. You don't want your kids to give away the crown jewels of your family. You don't want a shrewd real estate investor stealing your property from your kids, buying that property at 30 cents on the dollar. You want them to pay as close to full freight as possible. So the minimum bid for a property in probate must be at least 90% of the appraised value. So two questions on the test. First, who sets the broker's commission in a probate deal? The court sets the broker's commission. And the minimum bid for a property in probate must be at least 90% of the appraised value. So we can see that real estate is generally transferred using a deed, but it could be transferred other ways too, like a witnessed will or a holographic will or through probate or intestate succession. But the question also is, could real estate also be sold through Mother Nature? And in fact, yes, real estate could be sold through Mother Nature here on page number 84. I'll give you an example of this. So there's a couple of words, and candidly, I'm going to say this from the outset. These words are not very uh, pleasing, mainly because they all look the same, problem number one. And problem number two is that we never use these in real life. But let me give you a way to look at this. Let's say for a moment, imagine that your house borders, let's say, a river. So your house borders a river, and let's say one season, there is a high tide that basically moves soil onto your shoreline. So it's possible that over time, through the movement of water on your shoreline, it is possible that soil could accumulate on the shoreline, basically adding to your land. That process of the water moving soil onto your shoreline is called accretion. And you'll see this term accretion at the middle of page 84, right below this gray box, the word is accretion. So accretion is the gradual accumulation of soil on property bordering flowing water. So the gradual accumulation of soil on property bordering flowing water is of course known as accretion. Now, when you wake up in the morning and accretion has added, let's say 10 inches to your shoreline, you actually own all that extra soil. That legal theory that says you own that land that deposited onto your shoreline, that's known as a session. And you'll see that term a session at the top of 84. So again, I know these words sound and look real similar, but they're different. Accretion is the gradual accumulation of soil on property bordering flowing water. That's, of course, known as accretion. Title transfer by accretion is known as accession. So accession says, I now own all that extra soil. Now, the soil itself has a very special name. That soil is known as alluvium soil. And you'll see this word at the middle of page 84 under this paragraph of accretion. You'll see the word alluvium soil. Now, alluvium soil is the name of the soil that was deposited by accretion. So we have three words that are super important for the test. The first is accretion. Accretion is the gradual accumulation of soil on property bordering flowing water. That's accretion. Title transfer by accretion is known as accession. Soil deposited by accretion is known as alluvium soil. Now, no one's ever going to come up to you and ask you whether or not that's alluvium soil, right? That conversation is not going to happen, but uh, we need to know it for the test. And the last word is avulsion. And you'll see this word avulsion at the bottom of 84, uh, kind of above that word reliction. By the way, since we're on the topic of reliction, reliction is basically where a river recedes, exposing the land underneath the river. So that's known as reliction. But Above reliction, you'll see the term avulsion. Avulsion is the violent and sudden tearing away of land by action of water. So maybe you own a property adjacent to a river. There's some big storm and a chunk of your land comes detached from the riverbed. That separation is known as avulsion. So those are our four words that are pretty important to know for the test. Number one, the gradual accumulation of soil on property bordering a flowing body of water, that's accretion. Tidal transfer by accretion is known as accession. 
Soil deposited by accretion is known as alluvium soil. And finally, the violent and sudden tearing away of land by action of water is known as avulsion. So even Mother Nature can cause uh, property to grow through accretion and accession. So that's another title transfer method, ways to transfer real estate, accretion, accession. We talked about a witness and a holographic will, talked about intestate succession, talked about probate. These are all ways to transfer title to real estate. But real estate could also be transferred hostily. And a lot of people ask about squatters' rights, for example, and if somebody just breaks into a house with a bunch of guns and some grenades, can they actually take over a property? California actually does not recognize squatters' rights in that way, which actually makes sense. I mean, it seems odd that somebody could just break into a house with a bunch of guns and say, hey, this is mine now. But the closest thing we have to squatters' rights in California is here on page 85, and it's a concept known as adverse possession. Now, think of that word adverse. If you and I are adversaries, what does that mean? It means we're enemies, right? We're hostile to one another. So adverse possession is basically a hostile takeover of real estate. Now, I'll give you an example of how this works. And again, you can probably imagine that adverse possession is a very rare way that real estate is transferred. But this whole chapter is about transferring title to real estate. So we'll go over all the ways that real estate could be transferred Keeping in mind that in practice, the main way that real estate is transferred is, of course, by deed. It's not by adverse possession. It's not by, you know, accretion. It's not by a holographic. Well, it's generally through the use of a deed. But let's look here on page 85 at this concept of adverse possession. Now, imagine this. Imagine every morning you live in Newport Beach. So every morning you like to take a run on the sand so or the boardwalk. So every morning, you know, 530, you run for about an hour. So every morning you take this run in Newport Beach and one day you look up and you see this beautiful home. Oh, that's a nice house. Every morning you run past this house and it's like you, it's this weird kind of obsession almost like, man, that's a beautiful house. And a couple of weeks, three, four, five weeks later, you think no one's ever in that house. And you make a mental note. Hey, look, this house is beautiful, but no one's ever in it. You keep running by the home. Seven, eight months later, you're like, man, what a waste. This beautiful house here in Newport Beach overlooking the world and no one even ever uses it. I wonder, I wonder if anybody's even there. So you run up to the back door and you kind of jig a little, little bit and it opens. And you're like, man, I'm, I'm standing in this beautiful home. And you think to yourself again, what a waste. I can't believe someone would have this beautiful house here in Newport Beach and not even live in it. So you think to yourself, I should live here. That's the first requirement to adverse possession is that you not show the land, N-A-C-H-O. Now, if you look at the bottom of 85, the book, of course, uses the term oncha, O-N-C-H-A. Nacho are the same letters. It's just easier to remember nacho than oncha. So if you notoriously, and for nacho, adversely, continuously, hostily, and openly occupy someone else's land for five years. Now, in my story, I'm saying that you're living there. But legally, for adverse possession to work, you don't actually have to live there. All you have to do is occupy the property. Now, that can mean maybe you're trying to adversely possess a farm right next to your farm. You could fence that neighbor's farm in, and that would constitute occupation. So you just have to occupy the property openly and notoriously and adversely. Adversely means without the current owner's permission for five years. That's the first requirement for adverse possession. Now, Imagine that's actually my house that you just broke into. And let's imagine that I live in Ireland full time, basically the other side of the world. If you're occupying my property for five continuous years, even though I live in Ireland, would I probably come to know about that? Yeah, probably for five years. Now, if the requirement was five days, maybe you could sneak past me for a week and I wouldn't recognize it. But we're talking five years. You have to openly and notoriously occupy that property for half a decade. Now, how would I come to know about that? Well, maybe I would, I don't know, I would fly out to Newport Beach once in the next five years and I would see you living there. Maybe a neighbor would call me. Maybe, for example, I'd look at Google Earth or Google Street View and I would come to realize that you're in my house. But five years of you living in my house, the law says, I don't know, maybe 
you do own it if you could get away with living there for five years. So that's the first requirement for adverse possession is you basically have to occupy the property for five years. The second requirement for adverse possession is that you have to pay the property taxes on the property for five years also. Now, some people ask, well, how the heck could you pay someone else's property taxes? Actually, paying someone else's property taxes are uh, maybe the easiest thing you could do because first, everyone's property tax payment amounts are public record. And number two, everyone says their tax payments to the same place. So now if you pay my property taxes once, I might think to myself, man, I'm a lucky guy. You pay them twice, I might think, man, I'm really lucky. But by the third, fourth, or fifth, or sixth time you pay my taxes, remember we pay taxes in California twice a year, by the fifth, sixth, seventh time you're paying my taxes in a row, I might think to myself, hey, something's, something's sideways about this. I better check it out. So the first requirement is that you got to not show the land, notoriously, adversely, continuously, hostilely, and openly occupy the property for five years. Number two, you got to pay the property taxes on the property for five years. And number three, of course, you must file something called a claim of right or color of title. And you'll see this at the middle of page 85 and number three, color of title or claim of right. Basically, you must have some good faith legal basis why you believe you're entitled to that property. Now, here's an example of a uh, claim of right or color of title. Maybe you paid me $2 million for my house. We had a contract where you were going to pay $2 million. I took your money and I never gave you a deed. Now, is there a claim of right or color of title? Yeah, of course, you paid me for the property, but I never gave you a deed and you can't get in touch with me, nor can you find me. Okay, how do you get title now? Well, you could not show the land for five years, pay the taxes for the next five years, and file a court action and show the court, hey, I had a contract with this person that I was going to buy his house. I paid him for it. He never gave me a deed. Adverse possession. So again, adverse possession is where you openly and notoriously occupy a property for how long? Five years, pay the taxes on it concurrently, and have some claim of right or color of title you can then be awarded ownership through a process called adverse possession. Now, here on 86, you'll see a discussion of something called prescription or a prescriptive easement. Now, through prescription at the middle of page over 86, this is where you don't get ownership of the property, but you get an easement. And we'll talk about this more in Chapter 5. The process is quite similar, uh, but the end result is not ownership through prescription. The end result is just an easement or right to use the property. And we'll talk about this more heavily in chapter five. So these are all rare ways that real estate could be transferred. But I want to give you, uh, I want to show you one thing here on page numbers 87 and 88, where it says ways to transfer real estate. So in the middle of page number 87, you'll see the term private grant. So a private grant, also called a grant deed, of course, at the middle of 87, is maybe the most common way that real estate could be transferred here at the middle of page number 87. However, there are also public ways to transfer title to real estate. Now, what I mean by that is there are ways that the a private citizen, I should say, can transfer property for public use. Now, the three ways where a private person could transfer real estate for public use are Common law dedication, bottom of 87, statutory dedication at the top of 88, or of course, a deed. Now, I'll give you an example of these three, common law dedication, statutory dedication, and deed. A common law dedication at the bottom of 87 or the top of 88 might be where maybe you own a parking lot right across the street from the beach. You want to let the public access the beach through your parking lot. You don't necessarily want to record an easement formally, but Basically, you want to just put up a sign that says, hey, public beach access, cross my land. That's a common law dedication. Now, if you were to formally record an easement over the property, that would be a statutory dedication. The most complete way to transfer a title from a private citizen for governmental use is, of course, by deed, where you give the government ownership of your property. Now, famously, the great actor Bob Hope, back, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, famously deeded a lot of his very valuable Malibu land uh, 
to the government uh, on the condition that it be used, let's say, as open space. So he gave the government, let's say, a deed to that land and told the government that they could own that land, uh, probably that it be used on the condition of like open space or they never build condos on it or whatever. But those are ways that private land could be transferred for governmental use. Common law dedication, statutory dedication, or deed here at the top of 88. Now there's another way on page 89 that real estate could be transferred to the government, and that's a process known as escheat. Now this term escheat, the word cheat is actually quite appropriate because the government's not actually paying you for it in escheat. So basically in escheat, here's what happens. You die without a will. That's called dying intestate. Now we talked about what happens if you die intestate, right? Your stuff will go to the half, if it's separate property, half to the spouse, half to the kid, one third to the spouse, two thirds to the kids. If it's community property, it transfers to the spouse. So we talked about all that already. The problem with succession is that in all those instances, it assumes that you have heirs. What happens if you die intestate and there aren't any heirs? Then what happens? Well, then the state takes your property in a process called escheat. So escheat is basically where private land gets transferred to the state because you died with no will and no heirs. Now, if that scares you because you don't want your property to escheat to the state, you could make a will or I guess you could make a baby, right? One of the two and your property will never escheat to the government. So be careful of this question on the test. If the question asks the reverting of a property to the state due to no will and no heirs is known as what? Escheat. Escheat requires a waiting period, of course, of five years. Now, another involuntary conversion method is called eminent domain. Now, right next to eminent domain, I would write the word power. So the supreme power of the government to take private property for some public use is eminent domain. So again, the power of the government to take your land to, let's say, build a freeway is known as eminent domain. And there's dozens of examples of eminent domain throughout our state's history uh, and across the whole United States. But the government does have this power to take private property for some public use. That's, of course, known as eminent domain. And in fact, right next to eminent domain, you might want to write the word power. The power of the government to take private property for some public use is eminent domain. Now, the process where that happens is, of course, known as condemnation. The process where the government actually forces you to sell, that process is known as condemnation. So be careful of this question on the test. If the question on the test were to say the supreme power of the government to take private property for some public use, that power is eminent domain. The process whereby eminent domain is exercised, where the government forces you to sell, that process is known as condemnation. But is the opposite possible? That is, instead of the government forcing you to sell, at least theoretically, is it possible for you to force the government to buy your property? That's possible. Now, let's be honest. What's going to be easier, the government forcing you to sell or you forcing them to buy? Well, obviously, the government forcing you to sell is going to be a whole heck of a lot easier. But what legal argument would you probably have to make in order to get inverse condemnation to work? Well, in order to get inverse condemnation to work, basically, you would have to prove that something that the government did nearby makes it impossible for you to enjoy your property. Now, the classic example that you might find on the test about this is about an airport. Basically, it might say a guy owns a house near a small municipal airport. Over time, the airport gets so big, loud, and noisy, the property owner can no longer reasonably enjoy their property. They would have a claim based on inverse condemnation. Now, you've heard of Sri Racha, right? That hot sauce that people put on their french fries and sushi and all this. Now, Sri Racha, of course, is not actually made in China. It's made locally here in Irwindale in the San Gabriel Valley. Now, maybe you read what was allegedly happening to people in that area. They were having, you know, ocular problems and respiratory problems because 
There were so many tons of like pepper and chilies that were basically being processed. Could you get the city of Irwindale to buy your property based on inverse condemnation? No. Why? Because that's a private enterprise. Now, if the city operated that chili plant, then yes, you could get the city to buy your property theoretically on inverse condemnation. But this is a private enterprise that's causing the problem. So again, four questions for the test. Number one, the reverting of property to the state because someone has died with no will and no heirs, S cheat. Number two, the supreme power of the government to take private property for some public use. They got to pay you for it, eminent domain. The process whereby eminent domain is exercised is, of course, known as condemnation. And finally, anytime the government puts nearby land to a use that affects your ability to reasonably enjoy the property, you would have a claim based on inverse condemnation. Now, all of these pale in comparison, of course, to the deed here at the very bottom of page number 91. So the deed, of course, is the instrument that is typically used to transfer a title to real estate. Now, generally, there are two parties in, a, in any deed. There's the grantor and the grantee at the bottom of 91. The grantor, of course, is the giver. And you'll remember this because all our OR words mean owner or giver. Lessor, vendor, trustor, grantor, mortgagor. All these OR words mean owner or giver. So the grantor is the guy giving. The grantee, of course, is the person receiving. Now, here's the deal. You're going to buy my house. It's a million dollars. You're going to give me a million dollars. I'm going to take the million, and I'm going to give you a grant deed, most likely. That's a real estate transaction. Generally, money is exchanged for a deed. Now, there are a couple of things we should know about uh, the deed in general. Think about your home that you own. And by the way, if you don't own a home yet, I promise you, if you stick around real estate long enough, you will. Just like the jeweler has, you know, uh, a ring or a watch that they have or a car dealer has uh, gets a good deal on a car. If you stick around real estate long enough, I promise you'll end up with a good deal on a couple houses. So what will happen is I'll take your money and I'll give you a deed. Now, that deed, of course, is generally recorded. Now, that term recordation basically means every county, L.A. County, San Mateo County, San Diego County, all these counties have a recorder's offices. And in those recorder's offices, you can basically make an instrument public. Now, recording is actually a very safe way of ensuring your ownership is not questioned, but it's not legally required, which seems crazy. Deeds don't have to be recorded in order to be valid, but they should be recorded. So think about this. If I gave you a deed to the house and you never recorded it, in the public record, I would still show as the owner of that property. That's not good because whenever you go to then sell that property later, it won't show you as the current owner of record. It'll show me as the owner of record. That's a problem. And if you by the way, if you didn't record the deed and you lost it, that is a massive problem for you because you might not have a way to show that you're the legal owner. So again, recording a deed is absolutely critical, but it is not legally required. In fact, if you look at the bottom of 93, where it says acknowledgement and recording, I would make a little note at the bottom of 93. I would write the words, and neither are required. Deeds do not need to be recorded in order to be valid. Deeds also don't need to be acknowledged in order to be valid. Now, the term acknowledgement, and you'll see this on 93 and 94, the term acknowledgement is just a fancy way of saying notarize. So deeds don't need to be notarized to be valid. Deeds don't need to be recorded to be valid. However, here's the question you might find on the test. If you want to record a deed, the deed first has to have been notarized. Now, what does a notary do? A notary is basically a witness. A notary watches you sign something, verifies that you are who you say you are by looking at your government-issued ID, and they take your thumbprint. Now, the only reason they take your thumbprint is because if you then later, after signing the document, tried to deny that you were the one who actually signed the document, well, the notary is going to pull out their journal and say, well, why the heck is your thumbprint in my book if you weren't actually the one that signed the deed? So acknowledgement is required to record. However, acknowledgement 
nor recordation are required for the validity of a deed. So deeds don't need to be notarized nor recorded to be valid, but if you want to record, it first has to have been notarized. In fact, you might see this question on the test. The principal reason most people notarize their deeds is to prepare them for recordation. Also, recording is important because it completes at the top of page 95 the chain of title. Now, the chain of title is a, basically a record of all the owners on a property. So Bob sells to Mary, Mary sells to Steve, Steve sells to Bill. That's the chain of title. Unrecorded deeds would, of course, break the chain of title. Because if Bob sold to Mary, but Mary never recorded it, and then Mary sells to Steve, you'll not, you'll not see that Bob to Mary transfer in the chain of title. So unrecorded deeds, again, basically break the chain of title at the top of page 95. So there are many different kinds of deeds. There's a grant deed, a quit claim deed, a warranty deed, a gift deed. Depending on the word you put in front of the word deed, this will change the meaning of the word deed. For example, think of the term grant deed here at the bottom of page number 95. Now the grant deed is the most common type of deed in California. Think about the word grant. Grant basically means give. So if I sold my property to you, I'm most likely going to give you a grant deed. Now I hope at the bottom of 95, you write two words down at the bottom of 95. I'd write the words most common. The most common type of deed in California is the grant deed. And the reason that the grant deed is the most common is because at the bottom of 95, you'll see two implied warranties in the grant deed. Now think of that word warranty. What does that mean? It's like a guarantee or assurance of something. So one implied warranty at the bottom of 95 is that the property hasn't been previously conveyed. Now what that means is if you bought my house and I gave you a grant deed, wouldn't it be important for you to know that I haven't already given that property to someone else? Of course, that seems like a pretty fundamental warranty that I give you a grant deed and I haven't already sold that property to someone else. That's pretty fundamental. The second implied warranty at the bottom of 95 is that the property is free of undisclosed encumbrances. Now think of that word, what's an encumbrance? An encumbrance is a burden to the title. Now, I could sell you my house that has a property tax lien, a child support lien, two judgments, and an income tax lien, and I could even leave all those liens on there, but I got to tell you about those liens. So you want to be very careful for the test. The test might say, does the grant deed have an implied warranty that there are no encumbrances? No. It's just that there are no undisclosed encumbrances. So those are two pretty key warranties in a grant deed. One, that the property hasn't been previously conveyed. And number two, that the property is free of undisclosed encumbrances. Not all encumbrances, just those that I don't tell you about. Which is why, if the test were to say, what type of deed is the most common? The grant deed is the most common. Now, if you look at the top of 97, think of the term gift deed. Now, what do you charge someone for a gift? Charge nothing for a gift. So in a gift deed, the consideration is love and affection. Now, if, I don't, no one knows what that actually means, but if the test were to say the type of deed that lists love and affection as consideration would be a gift deed. Now look at the next one here at the top of 97, a quit claim deed. Quit claim deed, I'd write a couple things down. First, I'd write the words at the top of 97, no warranties. So a quit claim deed has no warranties, express or implied. Now what that means, of course, is that, I'll give you an example of this. Let's say for a moment that you and I are involved in some kind of litigation on a property. You think you own it, I think I own it. We both have some odd claim to the property. Uh, actually, I'll give you a better example. I had a student of mine, and I'm used to people zoning out in my classes. I mean, I do some classes that are 16 hours long, so I, over two days, so you can't, you, can't, you can't help it. So one time recently in Santa Monica, I was doing a class, and uh, about two hours into the class, one of the students just laid down on the ground and fell asleep. So at the break, I woke him up and I said, hey, are you okay? I said, just take this class next week. I'm doing the same thing next week. And he goes, oh, I'm so stressed out. And I said, 
yeah, you seem a little stressed out. And he goes, yeah, I'm the manager at the Red Lobster here uh, in L.A. And I said, I've been to that Red Lobster mostly on Valentine's Day. But uh, I said, uh, I've been to that Red Lobster. It's quite busy. And he goes, yeah, about six months ago, one of the bus boys was uh, kind of we closed the restaurant at midnight and it was one in the morning. I was getting ready to leave and the bus boy was sitting next to the dumpster in the alley. And I, I said, I, are you OK? And he goes, you know, I'm kind of homeless right now. And he goes, well, you know, what, man, you could crash on my couch for a couple of weeks. It's not a big deal. And uh, the bus boy said, really? And he goes, yeah, I just crashed on my couch. Not a big deal. So he was only supposed to stay there for about a week. One week turned into two weeks. That turned into about a month. And the bus boy had actually brought his father, apparently, into the house to stay with them. So about a month into this, the student of mine goes, dude, you got to go, man. You've been here for like over a month. You know, I can't. I can't, you can't be here anymore. And he goes, oh, I gave you some money for groceries and stuff. He goes, yeah, but it was, it was only supposed to be temporary. You can't be here for forever. So the busboy goes, I actually own some of this condo with you. And the student goes, you're a lunatic. That's insane. You don't own any of this condo with me. I'm going to call the police. Now, the police show up, and the police said, well, how did this busboy get in here? And he goes, well, I let him crash on my couch. He goes, And he goes, yeah, I even paid him some rent. He goes, did he give you money? He goes, yeah, he gave me some money. The police said, well, unfortunately, this is now a civil matter. You have to evict the busboy. Now, who claimed that they owned that condo, the busboy, like an idiot? Who actually owned that condo? The student. We are in a Liz pendants. We have a uh, color of title issue here. Now, in order to get that busboy to go away, actually, the student needed to pay like $1,500 to get the busboy to leave and sign a quick claim deed. So a quick claim deed released interest in that property, but without any warranty. The busboy had no legitimate legal claim to that property, but to release the claim, we sign a quick claim deed. So long story short, what document do we use to release title on a property or give up title? Quick claim deed. How many warranties does the quick claim deed have? None. The quick claim deed has no warranties, not even that you owned any of that property to begin with. Now, the warranty deed below that at the bottom of 97 is the opposite. Right next to warranty deed, I'd write the words express warranties. The warranty deed lists all the warranties that you have in that property. The grant deed has implied warranties, whereas the warranty deed has express warranties. The warranty deed lists all the warranties that you have in the property. Now, the last deed here before we wrap up chapter four is the trust deed. And right next to trust deed at the bottom of 97, I'd write the word mortgage. The trust deed is the California equivalent of the mortgage. So I know that might seem odd because we use that term mortgage constantly, right? Wells Fargo home mortgage, I refinance my mortgage, what's your mortgage payment? Everyone uses the term mortgage, but in California, we don't actually use mortgages, we use trust deeds. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Let's say that you were to pay cash for my house. I'm going to take your cash and I'm going to give you a grant deed. That's a real estate deal. I take your cash. I give you a grant deed. But most likely, you're not going to pay cash for my house. Let's say my house is a million bucks. You'll pay 200000 of your own money, 800000 from a bank, and I'll give you a grant deed. So you're going to use some of your own money, some of the bank's money, and you're going to give me a, I'm going to give you a grant deed, I should say. But you'll still have to sign a trust deed for the lender. The deed of trust basically is where you transfer title to the property, basically to a representative of the lender, and Wells Fargo's representative actually holds the title to your property while you owe the bank money. It's kind of like the title to your car. If you owe money on your car, the title to your car, of course, is with the bank. Now, this doesn't affect your life in any way. For example, you still got to put gas in your car. You still got to wash it, change the oil. It's your car. It's just that the title to your car is held with the bank. Same thing on your house. If you owe money on your house, the title to your house is basically with the bank. Now, just like with your car, if you paid off that car, you're going to want the title back. Same thing. If you pay off your house at the top of page number 98, you're going to get something called a reconveyance deed. So right next to reconveyance deed at the top of page 98, I would write the words pay off loan. Anytime you pay off your loan, the document that you get is a reconveyance deed. So that's a pretty commonly asked question on the test. 
the instrument used to clear the record from a deed of trust is a reconveyance deed. So if you have a loan on your house, you'll still have a grant deed, but you'll also sign a trust deed to benefit the lender. Once you pay off that loan, the lender will give you a reconveyance deed showing that you no longer owe any money to the bank. So you can see there's many different kinds of deeds in a piece of real estate. When you initially buy the house, you're probably going to get a grant deed. If you get a divorce, your wife or husband will sign a quit claim deed when they release their interest. When you pay off the loan, you'll have a reconveyance deed. So many different kinds of deeds. The document used to transfer title to real estate is a deed. The word in front of the word deed will determine why you use that deed. Gift deed, it's a gift. Quit claim deed, you're releasing interest. You get a loan on a property, you're going to have a trust deed. So this concludes chapter four. We'll catch you in a little bit for chapter five.